Jesus. But before he speaks, he'd like you to know that when he was 14 years old, he started the first National Judy Garland uh, fan club. Yeah. Stages, and it's the opening sequence in a chapter called Off Broadway, mm. The Wild Years. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Schoenfeld and Bernie Jacobs. <laughs> they liked what we had done with our tour of the Fantastics and thought we were young and promising. Their other client was the Schubert Organization. <laughs> <laughs> our first project together was something that I could not have never imagined. One noon in mid-May, I got a call from Paul Burkowski, the manager of the Theatre's Elise. He was in selling mode. I've got Harlan Kleiman, he said. He's got a play in rehearsal here. Never seen anything like it. It's called Futz. <laughs> I like the title. <laughs> Tom O'Horgan is directing. Random House is publishing. The La Mama Troupe will do it for the first six weeks. There's a full page in Newsweek. Tom O'Horgan. That was enough. <laughs> My ears were ringing. He had just galvanized Broadway with his production of Hair. I had already seen it three times. <laughs> <laughs> Harlan needs another 10,000, Paul continued. Do you and David want to raise it in and, co and come in as co uh, associate producers? An opportunity to get in on a Horgan show? It sounded too good to be true. <coughs> I'll call David and get right back to you. Okay, Paul said, but we have to move fast. David jumped at it and headed over to my apartment. The agreement with Harlan, with whom we, whom we had never met, <laughs> arrived within an hour with a copy sent to Schoenfeld and Jacobs, our new lawyers. We got on the phone with our investors. People arrived on English bikes waving checks. <laughs> and by 3 o'clock, we had the money in hand and had signed documents making us the associate producers of Futz. Now that we're associate producers, I said to Paul, can we read the script? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he said, you don't want to read it. <laughs> Come down here tonight and see a run-through. <laughs> David didn't go, so I went with our friend Martin Herzer, who was beginning a good career as a stage manager, having started with us at the Delete <coughs> on Now is the Time for All Good Men. Martin was bright, savvy, and had a wicked sense of humor. The house lights went down, and we heard a barely perceptible human musical tone, which was slowly joined by other harmonically discordant tones from off and backstage areas. The sound gradually increased in volume, it made the listener feel stoned. The La Mama troupe then bounded on stage in farm clothes, playing crude handmade musical instruments like wash tubs and saws. The tones evolved into a wordless song, which was at first gentle, then playfully confrontational, then maniacal, and finally unabashedly hostile. Suddenly it stopped. The play began. Let's give it a strange passion to our story, the troupe said in unison as they ran about the stage, whirling, swooping, and dipping. Paul Berkowski was right. I had never seen anything like it. It was a nightmare. Actors running around, screaming and licking each other, <laughs> simulating sex acts, switching roles and genders, sometimes playing inanimate objects. This was not acting. These were not performers who wished to be loved. <laughs> <laughs> the plot, such as it was, seemed to be about a farmer's sexual relationship with his sow, mercifully indivisible. <laughs> indivisible. Which, through, though in the privacy of his own barn, made his raunchy, incestuous neighbors so crazy, they finally killed him. No wonder they couldn't find the money, I thought. This is insanity. 
finally it was over. A slightly more than one hour running time had seemed like forever. I was speechless, but seething. Martin said, well, whatever it is, darling, you are the associate producer. <laughs> Paul Berkowski, wisely, I thought, was nowhere to be found. <laughs> Where is he? I'm going to kill him. We rushed out. Whether I was the associate producer or not, Futz incensed me. It was a violation of everything I knew about or expected from the theater. How would I ever explain it to my mother? <laughs> I went home and read the full page Jack Kroll had written in Newsweek. He spoke of an exciting new form and called the play a parable for our time. <laughs> the next day, I rampaged down to the theater's lease and find, found myself alone in Paul Burkowski's office with La Mama herself, Ellen Stewart. There were two telephones on two desks. She was on both of them. <laughs> with Tom O'Horgan on one and, and Michael Butler, the producer of Hair, on the other. Every time she changed receivers, Dozens of bracelets jingled percussively up and down her arms. She barely noticed me. For a producer, I was feeling very unimportant in my own <laughs> Watching Ellen Stewart gave me perspective. I realized that she was the real producer. Whatever I thought of Futz, Ellen and Tom O'Horgan had performed the alchemy that brought Rochelle Owen's creation to life. She didn't have to advertise it. It was all right there in her commanding presence. Our names might be the ones above the title, but we were, in fact, just checkbooks <laughs> who hopefully might have something to say about the advertising. <laughs> I felt like a phony, a poser, involved with a show I didn't like or understand. <laughs> I introduced myself to Ellen Stewart. Take good care of my baby, she said, and started out the door. <laughs> How come the troupe can only stay for six weeks, I said, trying to assert my producer. <laughs> Oh, they have other things to do, baby, <laughs> Ellen said. They've already done this show. Don't worry, she reassured. We're already working in a second company, and they will be ready. We did the same thing with Tom Payne. Tom Payne was in a Horgan and Lamont success by Paul Foster, currently in a long run at Stage 73. The troupe only does six weeks. Then they move on, baby. <laughs> and with that, Ellen Stewart left. Enter Paul Burkowski. I had barely opened my mouth when he said, Did you see it last night? Exciting, huh? And slapped an advanced copy of the Random House book in my hand. Futz and what came after with an introduction by the great theater statesman Harold Corman. <laughs> Clearly, there was something going on here. I had to find out what the hell it was. <laughs> the hip-looking preview audience arrived. And this time, the play was preceded by a seven-minute color film clip from Ed M. Schwiller's Relativity which graphically showed the slaughtering of hogs spurting blood and convulsing to their deaths <laughs> in Chicago stockyards. The film repulsed and stunned the audience. <laughs> the packed house seemed to be caught up in the play, and there were sustained cheers at the finish. Futz opened on June 13, 1968, and immediately became a reference point for the theater of the 60s. Clive Barnes, an avowed O'Horgan fan, gave it a superlative review in the Times. Bestiality, oh, final horror, has come to off-Broadway. <laughs> Futz has beaten its way into our, its controversial path into our ken. And I must say, I'm glad it did. Mr. O'Horgan has visualized Futz as some kind of Dionysiac dance, wild and fevered. He has evident talent, and wherever it's leading him, it's leading him fast. The other critics were either tantalized or outraged or both. <coughs> Lucille Lortel carefully selected, selected the productions that played her theater. Producers, actors, and directors assembled in her suite at the Sherry Netherland to read their plays aloud for her. In an unusual circumstance, she was away when Futz became a last-minute booking after another show closed abruptly. <laughs> she had neither seen nor read it. And though a liberal thinker, there was much concern over what she might think. Arlen and Paul thought that since she was fond of me, I should accompany her to a performance. <laughs> Walter Kerr, on assignment for a Sunday Times piece, was seated directly in front of us and kept his ears open for any pre-show chatter going on around him. Once the performance began, he cringed continuously and wrote feverishly. It was impossible not to notice. Lucille couldn't possibly be unaware of his response. I thought, this is a disaster. 
I feigned calm as the cast took its final bow. The house lights came up. Lucille patted me gently on the hand and said, It's biblical, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Her scathing review was half of an entire front page devoted to Futz in the Sunday Times Art and Leisure. <laughs> the other half was a rave by the avant-garde critic Eleanor Lester. The banner headline was Futz, Fiasco or Wave of the Future. I saw Futz many times in the next several weeks, at least twice stoned. <laughs> and I finally got it. <laughs> I, I, I could see why some people hated it. I could see why I hated it. And it's in its, min, its minimalist form, its egoless performances, its anarchistic style, were the antithesis of what we had come to expect in the commercial theater. And yet it permanently influenced my aesthetic. Rochelle's play was essentially a poem that was indeed biblical, capturing and using an essential part of rural America to illustrate the hypocrisy and hate of every society. Mm -hmm. The La Mama troupe did not act in the usual way, but in service to Tom O'Horgan's masterful orchestration of the text, the actors offered a journey which explored and illuminated facets and possibilities of the characters, the situations, the rural society, the language and imagery, and sometimes even the words themselves. The result was an anarchy in which everything was freed. Mm. Once I got that, I could never go back to Promises, Promises again. <laughs> <laughs>